He always finds that student or those students who you can just tell need a little something extra and he makes sure in his own quiet way that he does those things. Um, later on I found out he was also a lay speaker. Um, he attends Bethany United Methodist Church and um, he enjoys speaking. I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to hear him today. So let's welcome Dave to this morning. He's going to start out with our scripture. Good morning. Good morning. Our scripture lesson comes from the book of Genesis, verses, um, chapter 22, verses 17 and 18. <clears throat> and this is God speaking to Abraham through an angel. Hear these words. I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and, and as the sand is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. The voice of God for the people of God. Now, most of the time, scripture readings come from the gospel, four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or somewhere in the New Testament, occasionally from the Old Testament, but rarely do you get a scripture from the book of Genesis. But when I was doing the, my lay speaking training classes and becoming a lay servant, I was told the first time that you preach somewhere that you had to start at the beginning of the Bible. So that's why we had Genesis today. I want to take a minute just to introduce myself and tell you a little bit about me. Leslie has shared some things. I do teach sixth grade, again, at North Stanley Middle. I was seventh grade last year. Um, I've been teaching for about 35 years. I've kind of lost count, um, but I probably have one or two more in me still. I have a beautiful wife, Christy, who's sitting right over here. I have a stepson who just turned 16 this month, so that's an ongoing adventure. Uh, I also have a, I'm also a dog lover, or we are dog lovers, and we have two of them that live inside, and we have 100 cats that live outside. Uh, I can give you my address after the service. If anyone wants to come by and get one, you're welcome to come get one. Okay. We'll give them away. You only have to pay for it. I'm originally from Durham, North Carolina. It's a, uh, located about two hours east of here. Um, if you don't know where Durham is, it's, uh, there's a college basketball team there that I do not pull for. Uh, I taught there in Durham in a school called Carrington Middle School for about 12 years. It's a very large middle school, a lot, probably uh, at least twice the size of, of North Stanley Middle. Uh, then I taught at a private school in Henderson, North Carolina for another 12 years, or approximately. And in less than a month, I'm going to be starting my 11th year at North Stanley Middle, where I taught with Leslie for most of those years. How I got to Stanley County? Well, Christy and I met at the beach. Um, took her a little longer than it did me, but we fell in love. And I was living in Henderson at the time, and she was living here, so we just played rock, paper, scissors to see who was going to move to the other's location. Of course, she's a better rock, player, paper, scissors player than I am, so that's why I went up here. Um, <clears throat> the real story is a lot longer than that, so you'll have to hear it another time if the circumstances are right. Bethany became my church by default. In fact, I married into Bethany because that's where Christy went. While there, uh, there seemed to be a lot of pastor turnover and some health issues with the pastors, uh, etc. So I, or God, decided for me that I should probably pursue some lay servant training. And I did. And then our PPRC person got wind of that. And it wasn't long before I made my first trip up here to the pulpit. I must have done okay because about a month later they asked me to do it again. In our scripture today, we can see the importance that God puts on being obedient. The things he promises to Abraham are very impressive. Today, I want to talk about obedience and hearing the voice of God. When we think of obey, we generally think of doing what somebody tells us to do. 
when in fact that's probably a very poor interpretation. The word obey comes from the Greek word, and I'm not sure if I can pronounce this right, but pupakao, which means to listen intently. I'm sure that most of us like to think we're obedient, but do we really listen intently when God speaks to us? I mean, there are so many other important things going on in our lives. Who has time to listen to God? If anyone would have told me years ago, 20, 25 years ago, or even sooner, 15 years ago, that I'd be in this position right now, I would have laughed so loud. No way could I ever imagine myself doing what I'm doing right now. And you would agree with me if you knew how I lived my life for the first 40 years of it. In fact, some of the people that I used to teach with back in Durham have found out that I was filling in and doing some preaching on the side, and they were astounded. They couldn't believe it. But God planted that seed in me, and that I needed to become a lay servant, and luckily, at least I, I think luckily, I listened for once in my life. The first time, though, that I was in this position, I remember being really, really nervous. But that's got a lot better over time. And what has helped is that I figured out that preachers really just tell stories with some scripture tied in. And hopefully those stories turn into a good message. So that's what I'm going to do today. This first story is about a group of mountain climbers on the verge of a great accomplishment. They were nearing the peak of a mountain that few in history had ever reached before. They had reached the summit and were preparing to camp for the night. Tomorrow would be the fulfillment of a dream, a lifelong goal for many of them, to make it to the top of the mountain. But one of the climbers had a different plan. He wanted to be first. He wanted to be the first one to the peak so he could have the glory. That may sound like someone you know. That may even sound like someone you know who's wearing the exact same clothes that you're wearing right now. His plan was to set out that evening after everyone was asleep. Selfishly achieve the feet first and meet the others there in the morning. After dark and everyone was asleep, he set out by himself. He checked his gear, the weather was clear, and conditions were favorable for him to carry out his plan. It was only 30 minutes into his journey that things took a turn for the worse. The temperature dropped dramatically. It began to snow. The young climber found himself woefully unprepared. Before long, it was pitch black and freezing, with almost blizzard-like conditions. But determined, the stubborn young climber pressed on until finally the unthinkable happened. He had slipped and fallen, and was dangling at the end of a rope in the pitch black night. Unable to see anything and afraid hypothermia would soon set in, he called for help. Hoping he was still close enough to the camp for his friends to hear when he finally realized there was no use and he was running out of hope, he began to pray. Isn't that the way it is for a lot of us? Not until we're out of options do we turn to God. So the young climber began to pray. Dear God, I've been selfish and stupid. Please help me find a way out of this mess. And that makes it sound familiar too. No sooner had he finished his prayer than a voice came down. Cut the rope. Confused, he tried to process the request. But surely, Lord, I'll fall to my death if I cut the rope, he replied. Then the voice came again, louder this time. Cut the rope. Unable to convince himself that he wouldn't fall to his death if he cut the rope, he hung there all night and tragically froze to death. Even more tragic when his friends found him the next day. He was hanging only four feet above a ledge. A ledge that was only a few feet away from a cave where he would have had shelter for the night. Had he cut the rope, he would have fallen harmlessly to the ground and been able to crawl into the cave, able to stay warm until help arrived the next day. Now, if this story doesn't convince you that God really does know what is best for each of us, you may not be convincible. A well-known passage of Scripture is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God knows what we need. He knows. 
Surely he would have told that young man to cut the rope only to fall to his death. He speaks to us in many ways and on many levels. Some of us are better at discerning his voice than others. And I certainly do not mean to imply by saying that, that I am able to discern his voice. I fail miserably too. We often, so often we listen to other voices, voices that may lead us astray, something we know that God would never do. He assures us time and time again through the scriptures that he will never leave us and that he will straighten our paths. And I don't know how many people in here are Caleb listeners. I listen to Caleb frequently. And a favorite song of mine that they play, uh, I like Casting Crowns anyway, but one of their songs that they do that I really like is called The Voice of Truth. And it's one that when I hear it is often a timely reminder that God is the one who's guiding me. His voice is the one I need to listen to. Would God really give us such bad advice that we would plunge to our death? Yet we seem determined at times not to listen, since we oftentimes think we have all the answers. Before going on to my next story, I want to take a minute and just give you a little background information on myself. You may have already gathered that I have not lived the saintliest of lives. When I was younger, I was an absolute mess. I mean, if you went home this afternoon and Googled hot mess, the results might bring up a picture of me as a teenager. If you scrolled a little further, you might also see a picture of me in my 20s. And if you kept going, you might also see a picture of me in my 30s. But by the time I got to my mid-30s to late 30s, God had seen enough, and he got a hold of me in my late 30s. That's another story for another time. And Christy got a hold of me in late, my late 40s, which also might be another story for another time. So it's fair to say that I'm receiving proper counsel as of now. But in that time when God was getting his grip on me, I finally saw the light. I was saved on July 5th, 1998 at a small Methodist church in, North, in Roxburgh, North Carolina. I was amazed at this new entity in my life after that. When you get saved, not only do you get Jesus, but you get the Holy Spirit too. Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. John, 1 John 3.24 says, Those who obey His commands live in Him, and He in them. And this is how we know that He lives in us. We know it by the Spirit He gave us. And boy, did He give me the Spirit. It was like having a guidance counselor with me 24-7. There were times early on that I felt like I was having a constant conversation with a new friend in my head. Those close to me today know that I refer to him as my voice. Now I'm going to share the second story. This time it's a personal story. And like the young mountain climber, it's one where I chose to be disobedient. Fortunately, fortunately for me, and as you can see, my fate was not dead. That's something I'm pretty happy about. So let me preface this story by getting you to imagine something. I want you to imagine that there's white paint rolling down the shingles of a house. And the sun comes out and it dries the paint on the shingles of the house. Imagine the mess that that makes. Keep that image in your head until the conclusion of this story. <clears throat> this episode of disobedience only cost me a little time and effort and a dose of humility. It was the summer of 1999 and I was painting houses for fun. So I was a school teacher, we didn't need extra money. So I was doing this purely for enjoyment. I liked being on the ladder for 10 hours a day in 95 degrees. For whatever the reason, I was there on the roof of a house, paintbrush in hand trying to finish painting a dormer before an impending thunderstorm showed up. I could see it off in the distance. Thunder rolling, I could see a lightning strike occasionally, but it was pretty well off. I could see and hear the storm clouds off in the distance, and it was at that moment that I heard a voice in my head, and this was no ordinary voice. The voice was unmistakably firm and with a very clear message. It was not to cut the rope, but the voice said, Get down 
now. Very simple, very concise, easy instructions to follow, right? Well, for me, maybe not. Even though I've been recently saved and had a fever for the Lord at that point, I was still very much a work in progress, not completely whipped into shape yet. And Christy was still a few years down the road, so I stubbornly stayed on the roof to finish the job. I was painting, I was painting that door, trying to finish, and I thought if I could just finish these last few pieces of siding, I'll be done. I didn't want to have to put my ladder, take my ladder down, and put it back up. I just finished. But the voice came again. This time a little bit louder, a little bit more firm. It said, get it down now. And it was in no uncertain terms. And I knew it was God. My whole thought process at this point was that he was warning me to get down so that I would not be struck by lightning. And you'll see shortly just how wrong I was. I continued to paint. I finished the job, or so I thought. I took down my ladder and put my things away. See, God, I thought, I finished. No worries. I stayed up there long enough to finish the job, and now I was done. I was not going to have to put my ladder back up. Well, no sooner had I got my car, I got down off the ladder, got my car, I was going to go get some lunch, and no sooner had I got in my car to drive away than the floodgates opened. I had finished just in time, I thought. And then as I sat there, watching from the house, admiring my work from my car before pulling away, I was quickly reminded that it takes more than three minutes for paint to dry. And I watched a stream of white paint roll down the shingles. Now remember the scenario I told you to imagine before I started this story. I can't imagine how bad it would have been for me if I had driven off to get lunch and come back to a roof full of white shingles. Because the sun was just coming out like the storm was very short and the sun came right back out and it would have dried that paint on the shingles. I was also reminded once again that God's voice is the only one I should be listening to. A second opinion is never needed. After the storm, I scrambled to set the ladder back up and take a water hose on the roof and spray the paint off the shingles before it dried. Luckily, this is also how God works. There was a hose right beneath where this happened. So I could just put my ladder back up and carry the hose up there and spray it off. Instead of getting paid to paint someone's house, I would have been paying for new shingles. And you know, with all the money the teachers made, that would have been a problem. Really. I knew the voice of God, yet I chose not to listen. Why do we dis directly disobey God when we know He's telling us what is best? Only one of us knew what was going to happen on that roof that day. And I don't have to tell you that it wasn't me. My only worry was being struck by lightning. The thought of the rain washing the paint away never occurred to me. But God saw the whole picture, as He always does. He can see the whole picture in every situation. We need to trust Him, listen intently, obey Him. Sometimes we think we have it all figured out, when in reality, it's quite the opposite. In less than a month, the NFL season will begin. I know many of you are Panthers fans, probably. I'm a Steeler. But the team you pull for really doesn't matter. In closing, I want to ask the men in the congregation a question. In the middle of the game, if your spouse asked you to go to the store to get milk because you were out of it, or paper towels, or toilet paper, or whatever you needed at your house, what would you do? Would you be on your way to food line, or would you stay on the couch in front of the TV? I can only speak for myself, but I would be on the way to the store. And that's mostly because I like to sleep inside at night. <laughs> but there are some variables, like how much time is left in the game and what the score is, but generally speaking, I imagine most of this would be headed out the door. But if you hear the voice of God, and he asks you to pick up and go to a third world country for a two-year mission. Now that's a different story. All of a sudden we have too much to do. We can't do that. My job, my family, my night out with my friends. I can't just pick up and go. God made us. 
Who are we to decide what is the best? What if thousands of Nicaraguans or some other third world country residents never got to experience the joy of knowing Christ because one person they decided that they weren't going to answer the voice of God? That, my friends, may even be even worse than the death of a selfish, disobedient mountain climber. In all likelihood, he will never ask any of us to go to a third world country or any other country. And we may never find ourselves in a situation as dire as the young mountain climber. But we will undoubtedly find ourselves in situations where we need his guidance. And he still desires for us to hear his voice. He may tell us to stop texting and driving. He may tell us to make our family more important than our hobby. He may tell us to help those in need to give just a little bit more. He may tell us to soften our heart and forgive someone who has wronged us. None of us really know what personal battles the other faces. Or what God may be asking each of us to do. But whatever it is, are we willing to seek His guidance? Will we listen intently to His voice? He may ask us to do a lot of things, but can we? Will we? Can we stop texting and driving? Can we move our families to the top of our priority list? Can we give to those who need it? Can we stop using credit cards and piling up debt? Can we forgive that person who hardens our heart? Can we be obedient when He calls us to be? Can we cut the rope?
Alonzo and Marsha Barrier, Sophia Creature, Jackie Kennedy and Ronnie Roundtree, Eloise Rudy, Robbie Woodring, Woodring Sharon Balfrey, Kenneth Trent, Timothy Cody, Tommy Moore, Gene Starnes. Also pray for those who are looking for work, for traveling, safety and mercies for summer travels, the leaders of all of our nations, those experiencing chaos and acts of war, especially the Ukrainian people. And remember those people who, whose names have been lifted up by our congregation today. Let us pray. God of all comfort, our very present help in trouble, be near those we have just named. Look on them with eyes of mercy and comfort them with a sense of your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you will join me in the Lord's Prayer, it is number 895 in your hymnal. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We'll now receive our offering. this day. 